What's up, party people? So we're in chapter one here of Second Peter. And so we're going to jump in. This I really have been enjoying the New Testament books, and I did this for two reasons. I'm going to be full disclosure. Reason one is that they are so short. So I can get through chapter after chapter, put these videos out there, schedule them, and get them out to you guys. Right, So I wanted to be able to get more books out there so that people doing self-study can go through them a little bit more in-depth and get some, you know, some insight into some of these chapters. Uh, but the other reason I did is because I wanted to learn more about the church's role, what it means to be in a biblical church and a biblical relationship with God and all of that. And these New Testament letters were about building the church, excuse me, building the church the right way, with the right doctrines, the right beliefs, and how to how to act as a Christian within church um, and the world. So uh, lots of really hard truths in the New Testament, which I love. So anyways, let's jump in here. So in verses 1 and 2, uh, Simon Peter is writing to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace. Right. So Simon Peter's writing to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing. So right off the bat, he's saying, you know, I'm writing to to you guys. We're we're equals like you're equal with me. Um, this is an example, as well as in Titus 2, 13, other places where Jesus is called God, Theos, um, thus directly equating Jesus Christ to God. So there's evidence of Trinitarian thought here, which I think is. Fantastic, because a lot of times we don't get into the Greek studies. If you're interested in that, go on to the, the ESV, ESV, Echo Sierra Victor dot org, and you can actually read the text in the original Greek. They do that right there, ESV dot org. It's a free account. Anyway, uh, and I'm not like a sponsor or anything. It's done by Crossway. It's just a fantastic study Bible. So... In verses 3 through 15, God's grace is the source of godly living. Okay, so that's kind of the theme here. God has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. So God's granted us all the things that pertain to life, living life, right? Not being dead in sin, living life. Verse 4, having escaped from the corruption that's in the world because of sinful desire. So we were stuck And we have now escaped due to God's grace. Verses 5 through 7. Because of this, make every effort. Yes, Calvinists, we have to make effort. Um, Which is funny because they point to verses 3 and 4 as like, see, we can't do anything. God grants it and all this. And I get that. Uh, But then right here we have the flip side of that, which is make every effort. So it goes into a list. Supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. And it goes from faith to love. Okay? And it does it in a step pattern, like one after another. And I think the order here is very important. And I want to give some thoughts on why I think that in in an upcoming video. Um, But just off the top of my head, the order is important because faith is belief, which is the very minimum. That's We have faith. We believe in God. We glorify God through belief in Jesus Christ and his saving grace. Now, virtue, virtue is a high moral standard. So it's being above reproach. It's a having a standard, right? It's recognizing God's standards for our lives. Um, our virtue is lined up with God's standards for our lives. So virtue, then we supplement that with knowledge, learning about your beliefs and what you stand for. Then self-control, being able to control yourself, even though you have wisdom. Steadfastness is next. Steadfastness, this is what I think is funny. How do you be steadfast? Steadfastness is something that is facing opposition. So before you go out in the world facing a ton of opposition, you should not only have virtue and have knowledge, but you should have self-control. That was a big one because I'm not a very self-controlled person. I used to be uh, an aircraft mechanic in the military. And um, you learn that if you're right, you can be brash about it because it's the truth and it saves lives and blah, blah, blah. So you just speak the truth. If the aircraft is broken, you say it's broken. You sign it in the forms. You do that, right? 
you you don't have to have that much self-control and the military does not exactly reward people with lots of self-control they reward uh, people to fit into the culture and the culture is very brash but steadfastness is about having the self-control so you build the self-control after you have knowledge and self-control godliness right we are a fuller picture of what it looks like to follow God through faith in Jesus Christ when we have the solid foundation of the other elements in place then it's brotherly love we act out the love we're supposed to have for others and then it follows that we become examples of God God's love so I thought that was just fascinating so the order kind of matters there it's it, you can go as deep as you want with that Verse 8, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So verse 8 goes into th this is the outcome. These qualities and increasing in these qualities um, stop you from being ineffective and unfruitful. And it's like Jesus cursing the fig tree for not producing fruit. There is a clear um, metric that if you are living faithfully, that the fruit of the Spirit is going to increase. Um, in verse 9, it's, it's the opposite. Whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, right? He, he's forgetting that he himself has been cleansed from his for, former sins. And so, again, this is a picture of, of us and reflecting the grace that we've been given. We have been given grace as sinners. We need to extend that to other people. Verses 10 to 11, you practice these qualities practice. Sounds kind of action-y to me. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom. I'm sorry, I can't help but make the little Calvinist jabs in there sometimes. I know that um, a lot of people are getting back into the Reformed and Calvinist theology. So if you are, make fun of me back. I don't care. Uh, verses 12 through 15. Therefore, I intend always to remind you. So, they're foundational in a sense, like it's nat a natural flow. You know, you, he'll be putting off, verse 14, he'll be putting off his body soon, which is kind of interesting. Um, so, therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in them, the truth that you have. I think it right as long as I'm in the body to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon. So, again, he's saying... I'm reminding you, like I know I've said this before, and I know you get this truth, but I'm reminding you. And I'm also reminding you that I'm probably not going to be in this body for much longer. And so I'm doing my best to uphold these uh, truths to you and give you a record of them. Um, and how does he know? This is an interesting question. How does he know that he'll be putting off his body soon? So it could be a reference to John 21, verses 18 through 19, where, where Jesus alludes that Peter is going to follow where he goes, and he's going to be crucified. Um, that's a tough pill to swallow. I mean, for Peter to have potentially known that for a long time, um, very, very interesting. But that's got to be a heavy burden to bear. Uh, he's trying to ingrain this in their head. Again, the reminder piece, right? He's trying to make sure that they understand that truth. So in verses 16 through 21, basically he's, he's saying, remember the truth, hold out in faith until the return of Christ and stick with the God-inspired word. So it's, it's again, he's remembering the truth, holding out in faith, right? He's, he's encouraging to, to do that. Verse 16, that he's saying that they're not using create clever myths. Like the apostles are not using these clever myths. They didn't create up a bunch of stories and use genealogies and all this kind of stuff, but they're actually using substantive accounts of their eyewitness accounts of Jesus's life to show the truth that Jesus came to save us from our sins. And that there's good, good news with that. And in verses 17 and 18, he goes on to remind them that God himself shown glory and honor on Jesus, and they heard his voice. So again, he's bringing up this imagery of Jesus being baptized and the heavens opening up and saying, this is my son. Um, in verse 19, he goes on to say, you will do well to pay attention to it as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. The day dawns um, and the morning star, the day dawn and the day dawning and the morning star both symbolize the final judgment here. Um, and then in verses 20 and 21, scriptures and prophecy don't come from, from human hearts, but from God, right? And so again, he's reiterating this idea that um, they can trust the apostles and the gospel message because it's from God. And he's, he's laying out that 
foundation there. And really interesting, spoiler alert a little bit, but in chapter two, it's a setup for chapter two. In chapter two, he goes into a lot of Old Testament uh, and extra biblical references that uh, reinforce this. So there's chapter one. Again, um, some sections, the intro, and then God's grace is the source of godly living and, and some practical advice on how to live godly lives. Um, and he goes on to in 16 through 21 to, to say, remember the truth and hold out in faith and um, stick with the God inspired word. So he's, he's giving these reminders uh, to this church who has been in a very difficult place where there's been a lot of persecution and prep preparing them for the internal threat that he addresses next in chapter two. So there's a little bit there, uh, Second Peter chapter one. Let me know what you liked about that chapter, what stood out uh, down below. Like and subscribe if you're still watching. I really love it. I really appreciate it. It's, it's awesome. Um, and start the conversation in the comments. Let me know what you thought about this chapter. All right. Anyway, that's all I have. We'll get into chapter two next. All right. Peace.